the 15th chapter, Matthew chapter 15. My heart to the Ellison family. Kenny and Young, Kenny's dad passed away this week. So, Kenny, I love you. You know, I loved your dad. I got to baptize him. Amen. So, uh, he's, he, he, he lives strong. Amen. And uh, died strong. So, just, just uh, as things move on, just want you to know that this body hurts for those who, who do hurt. Amen. And you're watching today on Holy Wild TV. That means that you missed church here today. You're home watching it for some reason. We're glad that you tuned in. Please share this message. Make sure other people get it. Matthew chapter 15. Are you comfortable? Permit me, if you would, to read this out of the Message Bible. And I'll revert back to it to New International and other translations. But it says something I want to hear. To, to, I actually could entitle this message uh, the miracle before the miracle because this thing is loaded with miracles uh, Matthew 15 after Jesus returned he walked along Lake Galilee and then climbed everybody say climbed I'm not talking about a stairmaster I'm talking about a mountain that's 3,000 feet high he climbed a mountain and took his place ready to receive visitors they came, tons of them, bringing along the, uh, the paraplegic, the blind, the maimed, the mute, all sorts of people in need, and more or less threw them down at Jesus' feet to see what he would do with them. He healed them. Verse 31. Then the people saw the mutes speaking, the maimed healthy, the paraplegics walking around, the blind looking around. They were astonished. And let everyone know that God was blazingly alive among them. Which means at the top of that mountain, there was a revival. There was restoration. There was recovery. There was revival. There was excitement. You know, Fred's walking. Sue's seeing. Uh, people are hearing. Great things are happening. Now, stay with me. Because oftentimes when we preach this, we only talk about this later on miracle here. The scripture says, but Jesus wasn't finished with them. He never got finished with you yet. He called his disciples and said, I hurt for these people. That jumped out at me. I, the, the, the master of the body of Christ, the head of the, the body, the, the, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, hurt for the people. For three days now, they've been with me, and now they have nothing to eat. I can't send them away without a meal. One translation says, I can't see, send them away hungry and fasting. Can't send them away hungry and fasting. They'd probably collapse on the road. Father, I ask for your divine help, an unction from your spirit, God, the anointing. I ask God that you just uh, give us, uh, 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 as the body of believers, insight and revelation to this passage that will change our lives for not only the rest of this year, but for the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name. And everyone shout. Amen. Amen. God bless you. you. may be seated. I entitled this message, I Hurt for These People. I Hurt for These People. Over the last several weeks, I can tell you that we walked through, and again, you've heard me mention it, a member of our church whose 19-year-old daughter was murdered in South Mississippi. Amen. And he's already texted me today. said, Pastor, I'm going to be in the second service. Uh, Denise came home this week, the woman who was not only uh, stabbed, not only beaten with a baseball bat, but also shot in the back, and he tried to shoot her in the head, and then this man took his own life. She came home from the hospital this week. Amen. She survived domestic violence, if you would, from an ex-boyfriend. Uh, 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 Friday, we get a phone call. Uh, of course, Kenny's dad passing, and then, and then this uh, friend of mine, Mark Hawkins, had passed, and then I get up here and... Uh, uh, we get to, to work Friday morning, and, and Richard has a, a complexity on his face. His dad, 88 years old, they've not heard from him since Sunday, had collapsed uh, in the house, had fallen. And literally, the old statement, I've fallen and I can't get up. And he laid on the floor for over 48 hours before his other son found him. They rushed him to Herman Hospital. He's recovering. Amen. And uh, he's going to be in the rehab and then move on to whatever has, uh, life has for him. 
He's stubborn, and, I, and it kind of gave me an idea why my guitar-playing friend, Richard Golightly, is who he is. If you're around his dad, he's 88 years old, and, and he just gave up driving about six, eight months ago because he said, I'm kind of veering into the wrong traffic, and I realize it's probably not good for me to keep driving. So that means Richard has been going to Bel Air to pick him up to take him shopping. Now, I'm getting somewhere here. As he went to Bel Air to pick him up to take him shopping, uh, he takes him around, and it's kind of a very humorous story if you listen to Richard as, as he walks past all the paper towels, and he decides which one that he wants, and Richard looks at him in frustration and says, Dad, what paper towels do you want? He said, I need six in a row, and so he's, I need six in one package, six paper towels in one package. I don't know, at 88, how many paper towels do you really need? And uh, anyway, so he's moving through there, and, and finally Richard said, just take a four-pack and a two-pack and six, and we do that. No, I want six in one pack, and so this, it's a frustrating thing so yesterday he said he was at the hospital with his dad and he said his son his other son David uh who's better looking than Richard is uh going to bring his daddy glasses and his dad said my glasses he said yeah he said well I lost my glasses at the grocery store and Richard said dad they were on the floor where you passed out and he said no I lost them at the grocery store and Richard said to him how did you lose them at the grocery store and he said, well, I was shopping and I lost my... He said, Dad, how did you get to the grocery store? And his dad thought. And he said, I can't get to the grocery store unless you carry me. And then this morning, it clicked. First time in my life. As I'm reading the story of the halt, the maimed, the blind, the deaf the mute, that all of them traveled three days with Jesus, 30-something miles through rugged terrain, went up a mountain 3,000 feet high. They threw them, the Scripture says, that means that all of those people that got well, the blind, somebody had to guide them. The deaf, somebody had to guide them. The maim and halt, somebody had to carry them. That the only way that they could get to Jesus through three days of walking and fasting, and miracles happen after fasting, that they could get to the top of the mountain, is somebody had to carry them. And the only way we're going to see this church and the churches of America and the world explode is if somebody looks at people that are spiritually blind, spiritually halt, spiritually deaf, spiritually mute, and look at them and say, listen, I, I need to carry, I need to get you. I don't care if it's this house, your house, a business, but to get them to Jesus and take on, uh, take on a little responsibility that we got to help these people. I hurt for people. I hurt for them. I hurt for Denise when she went through this. I hurt for Jack when he went through this. I hurt for this lady yesterday who showed up whose husband died unexpectedly in the hospital. I hurt for you, Kenny, because you loved your daddy the way you did. There's, and if you don't have sympathy, if you don't have empathy, if you don't hurt for people to try to get them into Christ, to get them close to Jesus where they can get a miracle, this church is always just going to be a great entertainment center and you're just going to have to hear a great preacher. It's got to do better than that. It's got to be better than that. So to get him up to the top of the mountain, when, when Richard's daddy realized, I couldn't have got to the grocery store and lost my glasses. You didn't lose your glasses in the grocery store. But I carried you there. So in this text, we see some interesting developments as it, as it pertains to the crowd. It's very plain that Jesus was moved with compassion because of the determination of these people to stay with him. He hurt for them. They brought people to him. The people wanted to be brought. You know, some people will fight you. They'll fight you. They, they, and I, I'm not trying to be mean here, but we'll, I'll, I'll fight you over my disability. I don't want you feeling sorry for me. Amen. I want to try to help myself and do something for myself. But, we, but there are people that are stubborn. And fight. But these people didn't fight. They said, we need help. So they went up to the top of the mountain. And I've discovered, that as a believer, we can still find reasons and excuses why we should not care. You know, we're too busy. You know how much I love the word busy. Man told me yesterday, I saw a preacher over at the Harley shop and, and, and passed in. He said, man, I know you've been busy. I said, I ain't been busy in 17 years. I refuse to be busy. Amen. I can pastor two churches, have a great staff, and all the stuff goes on, but I ain't busy. But I am extremely effective. 
Amen. You got to change the way you think about this because busy people bother me. Busy people are insecure. They always act like they're doing something. Got to be doing something. Got to be doing something. You ain't do Sometimes you need to sit. Sometimes you need to sleep. Sometimes you need to exercise. Sometimes you need to take care of yourself. Amen. I've discovered, amen, that it's very important for us to decide, am I going to help or am I not going to help? You know, Satan, the adversary of your soul, he's not impressed with the fact you just showed up for church. <laughs> now, if you stayed home, it might have bothered him a little bit, but the truth of the matter, he's not that impressed. What really bothers him is when you decide to reach out to other people and bring them into the same Savior that saved you. That's what really bothers him. And you've got to realize the hurting. This verse here. The King James says it this way in verse 32. When Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion. The word compassion is love in action. It's when I love somebody, I love people, I got action to it. And many times we act like we got to be relatives to somebody to have action. Uh, yesterday it hit me. I, I know we use this term a lot, brothers and sisters. Did you know my friends are closer to me than my brothers and sisters? Amen. If I call you friend. That means we got a connection in our lives. You're my friend. A friend loves at all times. But I can tell you this. I know brothers that don't like each other. And they brothers. I know church brothers and church sisters that don't like each other. But they brother and sister. Because they share the same father's DNA. But to be a friend is a powerful thing, isn't it? Amen. I have compassion on the multitude because they continued with me. Now three days and have nothing to eat. I will not send them away fasting. Lest they faint in the way. This here, their, their journey. It, it, it had started three days ago in a place called Tyra in Sidon. That means, again, 38 miles of walking. Now, uh, I'm doing a little bit of walking. 38 miles is a long way. 38 miles is over, it's almost a, a marathon and a half. And all of that, you're carrying people with you. You're trying to move them along. And then when Jesus gets there, you think to yourself, Lord, stay here in this flat spot. I'm not wore out and tired. Stay here in this flat spot. And all of a sudden, he started climbing. And the word says he, when he found his place, which tells me he had been there before. This was probably the place he would go into the mountain to pray. This is where he met with the Father. So when he gets to the top of the mountain, he's in his place. There's something about being in your element. This right here is my place. I just feel like I can say almost anything right here. I can pray for people here. I can preach for people here. I, I, can, I, can, I, can share. I can even sing if I want to here. But then there are times I get out in other places and I go, this, this really ain't my place. Jesus found his place. And when he did, he said, now bring them on in here. And the scripture said they threw him. They threw, they, I don't know if they threw him down. They just tired of toting him. <laughs> just, just drop, just, I'm going to drop your butt right here, boy. Amen. I, I, I'm tired of talking you. Amen. They just dropped them there. They, 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 that mountain region they climbed, we, we can safely say that they had walked about 20 hours over rough terrain. Mark chapter 8 confirms the suspicion that we have when he says, I have compassion on these people. They have already been with me three days. So even Mark recorded it and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. Some of you have come a long distance. You've come a long way. Susan, I've been with you a long time. You've come a long distance. Mama Dolly, long way. Dana, long way. People come a long way. Don't they, Val? I remember you when you had a white Ford truck. Long way. People can go distance. What I, when I read into that is even if I've come a long way over rough terrain, a lot of hills and valleys, I've come too far to turn around. You know, your past should never determine your future. It may have been rough, but you can't stop now. Everybody has a story. I, I've been doing a, a series of exercises that have helped me, and I'm not boasting, bragging. I just thank God that I started. It's been good for me because my, my joints pop and hurt and creak and they sound like breakfast cereal. <laughs> Snap, crackle, and pop, you know. And even, even the guy that's been working with me says, man, I, can't, I don't even know how you're able to do these, but we've got to strengthen the muscle. And then I said, let me, let me hear your story. He said, well, my story is a lot like, a, uh, I guess, a lot like other people. My dad was a prominent doctor downtown. Uh, got hooked on prescriptions and took his life in his mid-50s. My mother was 58 years old and died of, of uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. Then after that, my brother, in a time of depression and drug abuse, died of a drug overdose. He said, I used to think I had a pretty good testimony until I shared it with other people and realized there were people trumping me. Everybody's got a story. Everybody's got a song. 
It's being around them long enough to hear their story. And please, if you don't have that testimony, don't try to develop it. Just let life happen. Can I get an amen? I promise you, you'll have a testimony before it's all over with. Amen. And I may have been through some rough patches, but you can't stop now. You've got to keep on moving. If you're, if you're going to compare your past with anything, it should not be your present, but your purpose. Amen. That what I went through was for purpose. I will say this till God takes me home. If it's not God sent, it's God used. And I have found over and over again when, when something that I know that God didn't send that into my life, God can use that in my life. When, when Denise told me the woman had been abused this week, uh, two weeks ago, on domestic violence, she said to me, Pastor, my, my sister and my daddy have been estranged from each other. They've not talked in years. She said, when this uh, tragedy happened to me, when this violence happened to me, my sister came from Alabama, and she showed up with my dad, and they connected again, and he, she cleaned his house, and she fed him, and I saw them come together. She said, Pastor, you know, sometimes folk got to go down for other people to come up. And I'm listening to this, I'm thinking, this girl got revelation. Amen. If God didn't send it, God can use it. Amen. If you get that in your head, then, there, it, then everything begins to work together for your good. Well, Pastor, I went through divorce. It can work for your good. I saw tragedy with my, family, with my mom and dad, but it can work for your good. But well, you don't know what happened. I lost a, 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 one of my children. It can work for your good, but you got to see it a little bit different. Amen. You got to see it just a little bit different. You got you to get hold of it. I remember years ago, I was bringing my daughter some wood. She lived in Pampa, Texas. I'll never forget this. I'm on my way to Pampa. Pampa, I ain't got no wood. That tallest trees are this tall. The wind blows through there. It will, will just knock you down. It is one of the, God forbid, ugliest places I have ever been. She lived in a place called Miami. I, I call it Miami. She said, up here at Miami. Amen. She lived out there in the woods. Uh, not in the woods. She lived in a cornfield. Amen. In a trailer in a cornfield. I said, bless your heart. My God, where's this boy dragging you? And uh, so I, I, she, she said, Dad, we need wood. And so uh, we, uh, we got wood. So I gathered up a big old bundle of wood. And me and my son, Josiah, we took off up through there. And we got, we got somewhere on 287, way about, about 200 miles, about 150, 200 miles north of, uh, of uh, what's that place? Wichita. Wichita Falls. Uh, and the, the, we stopped at a gas station to gas up, and I went back and I looked at the trailer, and the trailer hitch had snapped from the trailer. Snapped from the trailer. And it was barely hanging on by a little bit of weld. And I looked at that, and I realized that if we'd have kept going, that trailer would have snapped, them chains would have grabbed it. It had drug us all over, the, all over the freeway. And so I go into the restaurant, I mean, uh, the gas station of Valero, and I asked the lady, I said, ma'am, I'm, I'm, I have no idea. I don't know nobody up here. And uh, it's right on the border of Oklahoma and Texas. I said, I don't know nobody up here. I said, uh, do you know anybody? She said, oh, yeah, my old boyfriend, he's a welder. So she calls up her boyfriend, and he comes over from Oklahoma. I'm in Texas. He comes over from Oklahoma. Midnight, and welds, and I, I got the story somewhere. I, got, I wrote it down because it was an amazing story. His name was Camden. I never get now Camden. And he welded my thing They're all back together again. And, he, man, this guy was sharp. He was good. He, had, he brought grinders with him. He fixed that thing up. And I looked at him, and I began to share with him about Jesus. And he said, he said Pastor, you don't understand. My life's been this, this, and this. I'm a welder. I got, I got language like a welder. I got this, that, and the other. What happened was an absolute miracle at 1 o'clock in the morning. When that guy repented, gave his life to Jesus, and I realized at this moment, this thing breaking loose right here was, was might have not been God sent, but it was God used. Amen. He sent me emails after. We stayed connected afterward. It, it was one of them crazy stories. Now, first, let me walk you through some stuff. And, and I, I know, guys, I'm very sensitive toward language and toward the disabled. You know about my sister who, who was in a wheelchair when she passed. You, you know a little bit about my family. So I'm sensitive toward this. But the Bible uses these explicit words. It lays these words out. Uh, it, it says dumb. It says mute. It says, and, and I know when I went to school and I first started hearing some of these words about my sister, I'd get in fights with people over it. But I can't back away from some of this spiritually. But first I see here the spiritually lame. The word would be halt. Limping or crippled. It literally means both legs. David said in Psalm 38, 16, For I said, hear me, lest, lest otherwise they should rejoice over me. When my foot slips... They magnify themselves against me, for I am ready to halt 
and my sorrow is continually with me. David understood that even his slipping caused his enemies to get excited. And I hate to tell you this, but there are people watching you right now, and they're waiting on you to slip. They're waiting on you to mess up. They're waiting on you to, 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 to get into a place in life where you can't make it spiritually anymore. They want to see that happen. But I'm telling you that God has a way of spiritually giving us our, our legs back. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. That it can happen. The word halt means to limp from a fall. Lame has to do with your walk. There are many who slipped in their walk. I know of many. I, I have have slipped in my walk. You're, you're, you hurt your own self. But the question is, will you continue with it? You might have got, or do you need some help, somebody to carry you? And I, I have no pride about this. People have carried me. You carried me. You picked me up. You kept me closer to Christ than many did. Amen. Others would point a finger and say, well, he slipped. Hallelujah. Amen. Now let me steal all of his people. Okay, well, I should have said that. Amen. Spiritually blind. If there's one group that bothers me more than any other group, it's those that are spiritually blind. They, they don't know that they can't see it. It means to be clouded or to be smoky. Let me walk you through this. It's a loss of direction, no sense of purpose. You meet people, they ain't got no direction in life. They don't have no purpose in life. They don't even know why they're here. A loss of perception, no sense of judgment. Can't make right decisions. Don't know if, if it's daylight or if it's dark. Amen. It's like a blind rooster crowing at midnight. It's a loss of light, no revelation, no illumination. They don't get nothing. Nothing really kind of settles in with them. They're blind spiritually. Amen. It literally means in the Greek to be self-conceited, to inflate with self-conceit, to be high-minded to be lifted up with pride you'll meet people and say i don't need god i don't need jesus i don't need to i don't need to hear you tell me anymore like that what are they spiritually blind jesus said in luke chapter 4 that he came for those that were blind spiritually Amen. To try to help restore their sight. To get them going. Listen, the word also carries with it to, to make a smoke, to blow smoke. You ever been around somebody always blowing smoke? Yeah. Then no matter what you've gone through, they went through more. No matter how much drama you can conjure up, they got more drama. Yeah. Amen. It's almost hilarious for some people. Sometimes I just feed folk a little bait to see where they're at now. Yeah. Just give them a little bit. Amen. Just throw one of my kids at them and just see how bad their kids are. Oh, yeah, they give it right back to you. And they're blowing smoke, amen, to be slowly consumed without flame. Many portray a smoke screen like they really have it, but there's no fire. They're know-it-alls. They really know little. They're spiritually blind, spiritually dumb, to be deaf, to be dumb, can't speak, can't hear, can no longer hear the voice of God. Those that once walked with God, they can't hear Him no more. They just refuse to. They refuse to hear His voice. Those that are deaf, unwilling to respond. The word dumb here actually means to be mute or silent, to lose the voice. Do you know how many times God wants to talk to you and you just shut Him out? You can hear. You can hear other people, but you don't want to hear God. God's talking. And yeah, literally, if you can hear the voice of God, He's yelling, Talk to me! He sounds like a wife. Talk to me. I want you to talk to me. But you ain't listening. You ain't speaking. You ain't hearing. Amen. All through the scripture says, hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church. Hear what he's saying. So this morning, what is he saying to the church? That there are certain people that are never going to get well unless you bring them. Amen. Unless you help them. Unless you understand where they're at. The word maimed. It means to be, uh, to be in a cycle or to go in a circle, to be rocked, spiritually maimed, means to be crippled. Now, if halt means both feet, maimed means one foot. It means I got hit in one leg. I, I've got this, I have a little maimedness in one leg. Amen. And I can tell you what it does to you. When you get hit in one leg, the other leg works. But this leg right here, it ain't working. So you go around in cycles. You, you get to church, you're feeling good, this is good. Then you go right back into the drugs, the bars, amen, where you were, and you just stay in this endless cycle back to the church and back into the drugs and the bars, amen, and the gossip and the criticism and the gluttony. And you stay and you come back to church and then you're back around again and you just stay in this vicious cycle. A meanness. Amen. You come out of it and you go back into it. You didn't get totally, your feet weren't totally knocked out. You just got hit. But you never got over it. And you refused to bring it to Jesus to let him heal it. Because if he did, 
you'd walk straight. Amen. You'd get your stuff together. Amen. You'd start seeing things break off of you. You've been injured by someone or something, and it threw you into this cycle. It's vicious, man. you got to break from it. And then, and then Matthew 15, 30 says, and he healed them, which speaks of many others. Whatever they had, whatever they had, certain things in life are absolutely noticeable. But most of your injuries, most of my injuries, most of our hurts, most of our handicaps are hidden. We don't want anybody to see it. When we get around Jesus and we realize he can take care of this. The word healed in the Greek is therapuo, which means we get our word therapeutic. It's therapeutic. I had a friend say, hey, man, uh, you know, I'm flying up to Montana to this conference. I hadn't been to in 20 years. And uh, there's a lot of reasons for that, but I got re-invited and been invited for the last few years. And I thought, okay, I want to go. I need to connect with some missions. I want to know what's going on around the world. And this guy is a missionary's missionary. He's, he's an incredible guy, and I love him. And Josiah went to uh, missionary school there, so I'm excited about going up there. But he said, hey, man, when you get here, I got this hot tub, one of them uh, natural hot tub springs in Montana. It's, it's seven degrees here, but I want you to go get in this hot tub. Because it's therapeutic. I'm thinking, I'd die before I get there. <laughs> if it's that cold, man, I, I don't know how smart that is. Or how about this? Get me there and let me come up out of the water. Then we'll see how therapeutic this is. <laughs> Concerning the future, Matthew 15, 32. I have compassion on the multitude because they stayed with me. If you want God to have compassion on you, to love you in your darkest times, stay with him. You don't know how many miles you got to walk, how many ups and downs you got to go, how many people you got. Some of you have been carrying people a long time. It's time to give them to Jesus and let him heal them. Can I get an amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I have compassion on them. They stayed with me for three days, and they have nothing to eat, and I will not send them away fasting lest they faint in the way. He may... He not only heals us, but he feels us. Do you know what's coming next? What's coming next is a little boy's sack lunch and some fishes and some bread, some tortillas. Amen. Some fish sandwiches. Amen. They come in. You know they make fish sandwiches out. They make fish tacos right there. Amen. And the Bible says they were a little bit of bread, a little bit of fish. Everybody got a little bread. Everybody got a little fish. You know they didn't do this and this. They cut that thing in half, laid that fish in there, and had them a fish taco. Amen. Right out there. They, everybody had, had, was blessed. It was an amazing miracle. But it was the miracle after the miracle. Because, I, and I can't imagine what was going on on that hill. You know as I do, when you get healed of something, you get, you get crazy about it. Especially when you know Jesus did it. Amen. And you go running around, I can hear, I can speak, I can see, I can walk. Amen. He, he takes something off of you. Many of you know the miracle of when God took all the warts off my, I hadn't had a wart since. Amen. Took all the warts off my body and off my big toe. And when it happened, I would prayed about it. That's why I know it, it was God that done it. And I went running through the house and shoved my foot in my mama's face. And even she knew God had healed me. <laughs> I couldn't keep my mouth shut. I was so excited. I've seen miracle after miracle in life. And when that happened, there's revival on the mountain, man. Amen. It was an amazing place. People were, uh, you know, people that could, could not see. Now their eyes were open. People that could not hear their ears. And here's the thing I wondered to myself. Not only did he uh, heal them, not only did he feel them physically, but I, the sermons he must have preached, the words he must have said. Because when your ears are open, you can receive Amen. When your eyes are open, you can see. you got revelation now. I honestly, a friend of mine said to me yesterday, a little bit of appreciation goes a long way. A little bit of appreciation goes a long way. Can you imagine when Fred got up, he looked over at uh, Thibodeau and Boudreau and said, thanks for carrying me, boys. One looked over to friend and said, Susie, thanks Thanks for guiding me. I've always talked to you about Randy and Bubba. Randy and Bubba led me to Jesus. They were relentless with me. They were fanatics. They were pesters. They were aggravating. I worked for the Sonic. I, I was a professional burger flipper. 18 years old. My Fridays and Saturdays were consumed with alcohol. My Sundays was 
consumed with recovery. My son asked me yesterday, he said, Dad, when's the last time you had a drink? I said, November the 9th, 1979. He said, how do you know that? And I said, because I got born again November the 10th, 1979. Now, I ain't going to lie to you. I got a fifth of crown saved up so that right before I die, if God gives me a heads up, I'm going to take a little sip of real whiskey to see what it tastes like. But I'm hoping it won't make me backslide and get me in trouble. Sometimes I'm a little too transparent with y'all. And I didn't buy it, by the way. It was given to me. Okay. But when I, these guys would come by the Sonic and they would order little stuff and they would invite me to church and, and that intercom's on and they're talking Jesus. And, my, and, I, and I don't mean this in a racial way, but I had a Jewish boss who hated the name Jesus. And anytime I was listening to the radio after I got born again, it would bother him because somebody would be preaching Jesus. A guy named R.W. Shambach. Shout, yeah, somebody. You know, he'd hear that. And he'd, oh, he'd cringe. That devil would rise up in him. That religious devil. Shut that radio down. Anyway, before that happened, I, would, I did ride around the sun, and they wouldn't leave me alone. And finally, they said, we don't want to bring you to church. We want to bring you to a concert. Okay. These long-haired guys from Florida coming up. And I'm thinking, Skinner? Uh, oh, yeah, I love Skinner. You know, and Muscle Shoals is a big music place. And I said, okay, if I don't have a date, I'll go. And this girl, she was a bachelorette. Is that what they call them, the little dancers out there on the field? She loved me. And I knew I had a date. Her name was Becky. I knew I had a date with her that night. And this was before the cell phones and all that, and emails and texting. I couldn't get hold of her. And I couldn't connect. So I gave my word I'd go. And I went to church. Church. I thought it was a concert. It was at church. And these two guys sang. I can't remember any songs. I can't remember anything. All I remember is that I was spiritually blind, deaf, mute, crippled, halt, maimed, all of it in one. And them boys brought me to Jesus. They brought me there. They hemmed me in, literally hemmed me in in the pew, one on each side. Both have been miraculously born again. Bubba always in fights. Randy and I, had just missed going to jail just a couple of months before in a fight in Russellville, Alabama. We left before the cops got there. We were the, in, we weren't, we were the instigators and a part of it. We were drunk, stupid, ignorant. And then uh, now they talking Jesus to me. And I remember when they gave opportunity to give your life to Christ. I, I just walked forward. I just walked out. I don't even remember walking out. I remember kneeling down and crying. And I remember the fight that went on inside me after I left that place. I was in my Dodge Charger, and I was heading back up Wheeler Mountain. I was smoking a Viceroy as fast as I could. It's the only thing that was in the cigarette machine at the Sonic. I'd normally smoke Marlboro, Winston's, more of a man's cigarette. I've been puffing since I was 12. I, I hotboxed that thing. If you ain't ever smoked, you don't know what I'm talking about. Then I lit up another one. I had that eight track going, man. Up under the dash. Radio Shack, eight track, six by nine Craig's in the back of the car. I'm blasting Nazareth, hair of the dog. I'm fighting it, man. I'm fighting it. And it was like God said, Are you gonna give up? And I heard his voice. And I pulled that eight track out. And I threw it out the window. I threw them viceroys out the window. And I started my journey. And I've continued with him. And every slip and every fall and every hurt, I've brought people to him. And I, and I realized what an understanding, what a revelation, what a, what a grasp and hold of the word of God this morning to know that if we continue, the word continue to stay further, to remain in place, or, or with a person, to adhere, to cleave to, hang on to, to last, endure, to resume after an interruption. In life, you have interruptions. you got to keep going. What, what would it take to stop you from serving God? How about a fall, a, a clouded vision, a, a loss your voice of praise? Many times the people quit singing in church, they lost their voice. This morning I thought to myself, I'm such a sinner. 
I have things I fight in all the time. I'm fighting over this. I'm, I'm fighting on my exit out of this world. I'm, I'm fighting over will this church continue. I'm, I'm, I'm fighting over will we have the finances to, to take care of our, our, our wonderful staff. I'm fighting over uh, all these uh, things, uh, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, uh, the things that I've got. I've got too much stuff to do. I need to get rid of I'm fighting, I'm fighting, and I'm fighting over it. And all of a sudden it hit me. Why are you worshiping because it's about you? Your worship's about how great he is. Your worship is about how wonderful Jesus is. It ain't got nothing to do about you and your past and your, if you feeling sorry for yourself. Open up your mouth and tell him how wonderful he is. Amen. Give him a little praise in the house. Tell him, I don't care how bad I am. It's how good you are. And when I understand how good you are, then everything changes in my life. And then my praise begins to change, and all of a sudden, I don't feel so bad about myself. Because I now I know I'm with him, the healer of my eyes, my ears, my walk, my talk. Uh, y'all know what a yak stat? I'm a football buff. I love, love yak stats. Yak. What's a yak stat? A yak stands for Y-A-C. Roddy, it's yards after contact. It's when you get hit, how many yards you can make. Anybody can. I can run a ball 100 yards. So I can walk a ball 100 yards if you don't touch me. But once you get hit, how many yards are you going to do after? Fascinated with this old boy called Derrick Henry playing for the Tennessee Titans. Boy run 180, 200 yards. Again, the NFL, he's blowing all over people. People afraid to tackle this big guy. The issue is, it's not about him running. It's how many yards he gets after he gets hit. And I watch running backs. I say, let's see how many yards you get. After. And I watch people. I'm glad you gave your life to Jesus. Let's see how you do after you get hit. Let's see how many yards you get next. Let's see how much further you go on. Amen? Amen. Let me, let me close with this. Matthew 15, 32. This is out of the Darby translation. He said, but Jesus, having called his disciples to him, said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have stayed with me already three days. They've not anything to eat, and I would not send them away fasting, lest they should faint in the way. Fasting, my friend, is a directive. Fasting is a divine directive to the pride of the human heart. It is a discipline of the body with a tendency to humble the soul. And it almost always brings in miracles. We fast in January for a reason. We ask you, you know, and nobody's beating you up. Nobody's putting you on a Daniel fast. It was just, you know, soup and water. No, nobody's giving give you opportunity. But there's something about doing it together. Me and, the, me and the staff, we're all fasting together. And it's made it so much easier. We don't, we don't fight over or beat up each other. We kind of encourage each other just as much as we can. And if somebody, you know, eat whatever you want, whatever. But what are you fasting? How are you doing? And believe in God for these miracles. The scripture says, when you fast, when you pray, when you give. When. Not if. When. My hope and prayer this year, and I think you've already seen it in the news, that fasting, that intermittent fasting is one of the greatest ways to diet. That's his own diet. Imagine the spiritual side of it. But intermittently saying enough is enough. Right. Amen. I, I, got, I got to deal with this. The Hebrew word for fasting means to cover the mouth. Or as we say it around here, shut your mouth. <laughs> my mom used to say, you know, my, I can't remember my mom ever telling me, that's not nice to say. When did shut your mouth become a bad thing to say? I don't know. I really don't. I know some of your parents say it, but, but how are the way you say it? Close it? Just close Clothes don't sound strong enough. <laughs> Shut sounds better. Yeah. Shut your mouth. And then usually right after that comes a nice backhand. The Greek word means to abstain. Isaiah 58. Is this not the kind of fasting? I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. I said Tuesday night in here in a prayer meeting, fasting ain't about you. Fasting ain't about you. It affects you, but it ain't about you. Fasting, my friend, if you look at it again, is to help hurting people. It's to break the yokes. Amen. It's to set the oppressed free. 
is to break every chain. That's what fasting is for. Amen. And as I saw this scripture, three days. Three days is the great fast. That they had been fasting, walking, exercising, if you will, pressing up the mountain, carrying the sick, the lame, those that were in need, up to the mountain. Those that were blind, those who couldn't hear, those who couldn't talk, leading and guiding them up the mountain. And when they got them there, miracles broke out. Watch this, Maris. Watch this. Hold on. You got to fast to last. See, that's what you got to do. You got to repeat me. You got to fast to last. You got to pray to stay. You got to give to live. You got to read to lean. You got to fast to last. You got to pray to stay. You got to give to live. You got to read to lean. Pick it up. You got to fast to last. You got to pray to stay. You got to give to live. You got to read to leave. You got to walk to walk. You got to talk to talk. You got to fly real high. And if you can't hack it, stand with me. I believe in miracles. I believe with staying with him. I believe in continuing on. I believe if he hurt for people, then the body of Christ has been missing it. We got to hurt for people. You got to let your heart break for that which is breaking his heart. Paul said, I want to know him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. That if you're suffering, I want to fellowship with you. I want to connect with you. And I want to see the power of his resurrection. Could we gather at the altar? You don't have to move, but if you'd like, come up here. Just gather at the altar with me. Let's close in prayer. If I'd have known at that Harley shop as I met with Mark and his wife and her name escapes me that in within three weeks he would be dead. I would have had more compassion for him. Y'all spread out that way so other people can get in. Y'all spread out. I'd have had more compassion for him. The issue is we don't always know. We know that Rhea's husband's been taken to the hospital right now to have open heart surgery. I was with Bob in the hospital. That's why you just don't miss them opportunities. If you can, if you can do it, if you can make it without making excuses. Then your little honey, bless me, you'll know that. Before he passed, very faithful in his house. I told somebody the story this week of the Havards. Brother, sister Havard. 25 years with me. They continued with Jesus. 50 years before he ever found a church. When he found his house, he never left me. He followed me from church to church. When he died, then his wife, within a year, Sister Havard passed. Went to visit her at the nursing home in Dayton. She told me, she said, Pastor, not the nursing home, the assisted living. They, she was free to go if she wanted to. Go anywhere she wanted. She said, I walked outside and I saw that gate. It's right, right there on heading out toward Kennefick. She said, I saw that gate. She said, Pastor, I took off running toward that gate. I got right outside the gate. I got so tired, I just laid down and let them catch me. <laughs> but those are stories you take to the grave with you. You don't forget that. All of you know somebody. All of you know somebody. All of you know somebody who needs to be brought to Jesus. Yeah. Now, don't don't let me I ain't, don't mess this up. I ain't asking you to bring them to church. Because that's what we always think. Right. That's okay if you do. Because a lot of times it happens in this house. People get saved and born again and healed in this house. Understand that. But I just want you to present him. Yeah. 
I want you this year to realize there are Denise's and there are Jack Schultz's and, and there are Mark's and, and, you know, and Richard's dad. And, and, and it's going to happen again this week and again next week and the week after. Can you have compassion on them? Can you have a heart for them? Can you love them? Amen. Can you present Christ to them? Can you? I, nobody's asking you to talk, haul, haul them 38 miles. Nobody's telling you to, to, to walk them up a 3,000 uh, foot mountain. Just call them, text them. This this week in the in the in the prayer meeting, uh, I wish I had my phone with me. Uh, but I, all I did was take my index, and that was my prayer list. And I went through there, and I saw so many people have already passed from this life, and I just went through it. And I said, "Oh, thank you, Lord." And I was, they were part of my life, and I was a part of theirs. And I started praying for you. And then then I did something a little different. While I was praying, I was texting them. I text. I'm praying for you right now. I'm praying for you right now. I'm praying for you right now. Now, that meant two things. First off, I was praying for them right now. And second, you ain't at the prayer meeting. Yeah. But I let them know because I knew their hurts and their pains. Keep fasting. Keep praying. Keep believing. You know somebody that I mentioned that came to your mind. If they came to your mind, would you put your hand up right now? They came to your mind, spiritually blind, can't see, smoke screen, they're blind. No walk with God. They won't listen to his voice, nor will they voice that they even know him. Just hold your hands up, that's you. You know somebody like that. And let's pray this together. Lord Jesus. Use me to reach my friend. Let me have compassion. Let me hurt for them. Let me move out of the way and get you closer to them. I'm believing for miracles. I'm believing for eyes to open, ears to hear, mouths to praise, feet to move. I'm thanking you that the same miracle that you've worked in my life, you're going to work in their life. Come on, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, somebody, real quick, put your hands on my friend Mike here. Put your hands on him. Amen. Uh, your, your son, I'll never leave him out. I know you got caretakers and things, but I pray for him. It's Cameron. I lift Cameron up. First time I heard him in church, I thought somebody was talking in tongues behind me. You might, you may realize he is. Amen. But we won't quit praying for your son. Amen. Those, you know, I, again, I, my sister, every time I talk to my sister, you know what she said? Pray for me. Pray for me. One day we're all going to get healed. Amen. Yeah. Father, in Jesus' name, stop the degeneration of Mike's sight right now in Jesus' name. Reverse it, reverse it, reverse it, reverse it. I speak in Jesus' name. You reverse that. And by the authority, God, of the Word of God, I know that He can be healed. I know that He's walking in healing. And I proclaim Him healed. God, in Jesus' name, God, that His vision starts moving back. And we want to see the miracle. Now, Lord, there are people here that have atrophies. Lord God, they're stiff in joints. I pray in the name of Jesus that you'll lose them right now. Those that are fighting with cancers and diabetes and all types of body ailments, Lord, we want to be well till we go to heaven. We want them to do an autopsy on us and say, well, I don't know what happened. They just wore out. That's all I can tell. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus that you bless your people today. Amen. That you heal us as we fast, as we pray, as we believe, as we walk and continue with you. In Jesus' name name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Give each other a